Today, we have a special guest, one of my favorite people that I've had the chance to speak to. If you ever read his book, you need to read his book. Don't walk to Barnes and Nobles. Like, before I'm done, before I even get to saying his name, you should have already bought it on Amazon. But the book is called The Seventh Principles. We talked with Eric Yates, the author, months and months ago, but that is not why he is here. Uh, Eric, I brought you here for one reason and one reason only. I want to see blood in these streets. Uh, you have been tearing it up on Twitter. You have not been holding back. It's been an absolute treat to just sort of see you. I like to say, come and break out of your shell, if anything, as this quiet economist type who decided to actually point out, wait a minute, these people are the ones actually running the show, but you're an idiot, and this is why you're an idiot, and this is why you're an idiot, and this is why you're an idiot. I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to let the smartest person on this call right now start talking. Eric, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing good, man. Yeah, I, uh, I've been waking up a lot this week and choosing blood on Twitter, um, but Look, you know, I, I, I try to be more measured in what I say, but every now and then, um, you know, you just, you, you see a few things going around like this, uh, whoever the PhD economist was, who was going off about, you know, Bitcoin transaction speed and how that's, you know, a fatal issue for the network. And then you have Krugman retweeting it and making the same argument. And uh, I, what did I comment on that? I think... Um, Oh, yeah. Just because the first thing that came to my head was I, I know 14 year olds who don't make this logical fallacy and they're, they've read more than you guys have. And, you know, we're talking about these highly respected people in the economic and financial media who continue to like, you know, they continue to push this narrative over and over again. And they just haven't read, you know, more than like a cursory review of an understanding of this topic. And then they're opining, you know, greatly opining. And, uh, and yeah, it's just kind of absurd. And, I, you know, it's not that I think that they're stupid. It's not that I think that they're dumb enough to really make these mistakes. It's just that they're clinging to a narrative that supports, you know, their current user base. And, um, and I think that that's wrong. And I think that, you know, you have to fight fire with fire a little bit sometimes. Let's, let's unpack a little bit of this. Cause like you bring up, I think a, a tweet that a lot of Bitcoiners got a chance to see, I'll read it off. It was from Pontus Rendall essentially saying, the more I read about crypto, the more I realize how useless they are. Bitcoin can theoretically handle seven transactions per second at a cost of 2,500 kilowatts an hour. An average home uses about 1,000 per month. A transaction takes about 10 minutes to be settled. I mean, your response I thought was brilliant to just read some books. I think he should just read your book, but I think this is, in my eyes at least, and my response to him was like, you're comparing two things that aren't related. Why don't you actually instead go and compare how much energy it takes to maintain just one credit card processor and how long that transaction is going to take to get settled and all the energy that used that gets used just for one store and one bank to have that transaction through line. So I'm curious if you kind of see it like that, or maybe you're looking at things a little differently with that example. Yeah, I think that, um, well, I guess the first question is, how do you want to attack and how do you want to approach that argument? Because um, there's, there's a few different areas that he's covering with all of it. I mean, he starts off with, we don't have enough transaction speed. He compares that to the cost per energy per transaction. And, um, and then he makes a comparison of transaction speed to the Visa network. So like those are three major fallacies right there. Um, Number one, the transaction speed of a base layer should be compared apples to oranges with another monetary base layer. So if we're comparing transaction speed per second, then we want to compare that to what are base layers of the current financial system and what is their speed? And that's ACH, Fedwire, Clearinghouse, all these different systems that we use. And those take, you know, days, if not weeks to actually have some form of settlement. And they can't handle as much and do it in the same amount of time that Bitcoin can, can have. So... That right there is probably like the first main issue that I would attack and just like, you know, cuts the legs out from under it in the beginning and say like, no, it's just that's the wrong comparison in the first place. That doesn't make any sense. And then you move to um, the energy argument and the question is, well, all this energy that it consumes, um, what is that going to? Is it going through to transaction throughput or is that going through 
the network for another purpose. And that other purpose being that we're trying to actually secure the network. So it's, it's a very, once again, an apples to oranges comparison, and it's the wrong metric to actually be looking at. We want to be saying, um, you know, the amount of energy that's used is for the security of the network, and that's comparing the energy consumption of these alternative networks as well. It's a very different comparison. Yeah, I feel like there's so much wrong with that statement. It's like almost difficult to unpack. It's sort of like saying like, right. this one time I was walking down the street and I stubbed my toe and also a seagull shit on my head. And you're just like, what? What, what does that have to do with anything? Like, uh, where does the claim that Bitcoin can only handle seven, transac seven transactions per second, where does that even fucking come from? Is that like an, is that an average of the number of trans, like what, what is that even from, do you know? Oh, that's a good thing. So I sourced it in my book um, and I'm actually trying to remember. Um, it's it's based on just historical throughput that we've seen and where it's topped out during prior bull markets. Um, and it's typically in that five to seven range that we've seen where, you know, um, the, fees, the, the economic balance between fees and the ultimate throughput that we'll see on the network. So that, that's the measurement of on-chain transactions then. Right. Without without any consideration to the light. But it's final network. settlement, right? Yeah, final settlement on chain transactions. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas like uh ACH, like it's literally a text file that's sent over like FTP and as you said, takes fucking days. And like yeah, because people have to call each other up and banks have to update accounts and then they have to call the other bank and they have to say, okay, we're making this change. We're going to, this is the address that we're sending to. Is that correct? This is the person and they have to run checks. Is this person allowed to send this money? Are there any sort of, you know, legal constraints around that? Um, you're also going to get tracked if there's, you know, a certain degree of value that exists on that transaction. If it's going international, there's a whole other level of, you know, checks and balances that it has to flow through. That's a system that you're dealing with that you're comparing it to. And that's why it takes days. And if you're, you know, if you got some issues with it, then it could even be weeks and it could also not go through at all. Yeah, I've never understood. And one of the figures that I've seen thrown around as well is. You're muted there, P. Sorry, everyone. Um, what I was saying, one of the things that I've also th seen thrown around is uh, like Visa or MasterCard, you know, throughput, because which is ridiculous because credit cards payments can be clawed back for like, what is it, like three or six months even? So like, how does that, where do those numbers even come from? Right, right. So it's like, once again, it's apples to oranges, right? Like Bitcoin is a bare reserve asset. It's final settlement. It's an asset where when you send it, to another person, they own the asset themselves. They have full control over it. That is, um, it's not a credit-based monetary system or a credit-based financial transaction system. You know, credit cards are credit. They, when you send, whether it's, and, and you can think of it over Venmo or over Cash App and all the same ways, when you send money to another person, they don't physically receive that money. When they take that money from their Venmo account or from their credit card at the end of the month, and they either settle it to the account or on a credit card, they pay it off. That's when the final settlement occurs. So effectively, the purpose of a credit card transaction is to export transactions to a layer of credit where we have this centralized party like a credit card company. And they have these accounts. You make a transaction. They update their accounts. They're taking the risk that you may not ultimately pay that money back in the future. So they allow us to do a lot more rapid transactions very quickly as opposed to you having to ACH payment the coffee shop that you go to and all these other different places. So it's a similar concept. You have to order your credit. coffee like three days prior. Be like, I'm going to ACH right. you the money. I'll show up 72 hours from now if, if we're both lucky. And, uh, you know, then you'll give me your coffee. Yeah, exactly. And so it's just, we create these systems so that, um, you know, we can have more transaction throughput. And that's like one of the primary nature of, uh, you know, these credit card systems. And that's why there's a 5% transaction fee that they get paid in order to take on that risk of final settlement when it does come around. And um, so once again, it's just a very different uh, comparison. Now, if you were to make the proper comparison to a credit card company, we could say, okay, well, we have the Lightning Network. What's exactly. the difference? There's no 5% fee. It's also fully collateralized and it's faster. So the Lightning Network itself is a true innovation. It's like a fully collateralized credit system. Yeah, that it's that cannot be understated. It's pretty revolutionary. Also, I'm realizing right. we didn't give you the opportunity to introduce yourself and tell listeners who you are and what you're about. Can you spend like 30 seconds um, 
giving us the uh, the spiel. Totally. Um, so I'm a dude, and I, uh, you know, I started off in finance. I uh, I worked for a firm that did corporate finance and restructuring. So we were we were kind of like we we're the largest uh, consulting firm in the world for like bankruptcy. Um, so usually when there's like a major bankruptcy, you have advisors come in and take control of companies and like turn it around. So I started off my career in that. And then I moved to a private equity fund where we would invest in companies that were like distressed or declining in different ways. So I started to get a lot of exposure to um, a lot of the malinvestment that exists within our economy through a lot of that. Um, all the while, I've always been, you know, very free market uh, minded economics uh, thinker. And that's kind of like a hobby that I was always interested in. And, you know, I heard about Bitcoin in like 2015. And then in 2017, I took a little bit more, well, 2016, I took a bit more of a serious look at it, but it wasn't until 2017 that I like really came around to it. And because, you know, I'm a, I'm a CFA as well, like I have this very traditional finance knowledge base and it took me a very long time to come around to Bitcoin and say, oh, I understand its value proposition. It's a solution to central banking. And I thought about it through this traditional finance framework that I see people, you know, to this day, making all the same mistakes that I made for years. And, um, and I eventually came around to it um, once I kind of realized like, oh, this is a monetary asset. It's not based on cash flows, like all the other assets that we're constantly assessing. Um, you know, once I came to that and I realized this is a solution to central banking as you expand throughout all the other capabilities that it has, other than it's just like a scarce form of money. Um, that's when it really hooked me. And then it was towards the end of 2019, I decided that I wanted to, you know, quit traditional finance. I always had this kind of like nihilistic view of that world. Um, the game is what it is. And, you know, I don't really know how this ends, but one day it's going to end. And once it clicked with Bitcoin with me, I was like, oh shit, this is how it ends. And uh, so I said, fuck it. And I sold my place, moved home with my mom and uh, just start getting cracking on supporting all this. So Q, we're out of mom's basement as well right now. And uh, Dude, yeah, I wrote, I wrote a book too. Um, and don't now make me feel bad. Come on, tell the people the more. title of your book. It doesn't have to be like a super secret. Yeah, The Seventh Property. Um, and so, what is that a reference you know, to? Kind of, yeah, based on my whole spiel, um, I realized quickly that there wasn't like a good starting literature for financial people coming into this. And I think that the thesis where you have to, before you can even talk about Bitcoin to people, you have to define the problem for them because it's a complicated problem that people aren't very aware of. Um, so when I came from the traditional finance world, I didn't see a lot of resources that were really selling people in the right way. Not really as much based on theory, but based on historical facts, trends to really define the problem. Um, and I just kind of got deep and I wasn't really planning on writing the book. And then um, I just was writing core information out and I really quickly was like, no, I think it makes total sense to just turn this thing into a book. And I did. And then, um, and really the, the name, the seventh property is in reference to this. I defined this framework in the beginning. Um, you know, people get, I think like a lot of people, when I first was getting involved in the industry, were kind of confused about how, and well, I think still to this day, people are very confused about the ideas of like, what backs Bitcoin? What is fundamental to Bitcoin? Um, and that's a confusing question because there's a lot of different frameworks from which people view it typically myopically from like the background that they come from. If you're an engineer, you say it's backed by like energy or like, you know, if you're somebody with an economics background, you'll say it's backed by monetary properties. Um, and I think, you know, what I wanted to push in the book at the beginning is I think it's really important to think about these questions from an economic framework. And it's not that the other ones don't have value, but you, we need to be precise with our words because we're on the verge of a monetary revolution here. And um, in the way that we frame things and doing that, um, doing that very thoughtfully so that we can argue at, you know, the highest scales when, you know, one day I think we're going to see 60 minutes with like, you know, Paul Krugman on there and some sort of authority in the Bitcoin world. And we're going to have to be very clear with exactly how we want to be pushing these messages. And I think the economic framework is very important for that. So when I got into this, I was like, okay, there's all these monetary functions. Those are these monetary properties. Uh, if you read the Bitcoin standard, safety and talks about Bitcoin saleability across these different dimensions. I was like, how do we think about money? So I kind of frame it in the first chapter and I say, you know, here's a framework for thinking. And I go through the dimensions. I go through the functions, you know, the functions being like store value, medium of exchange, unit of count. And then I, what I do is I boil that all down to like, really all of that is enabled by six monetary properties. And, um, you know, scarcity, durability, divisibility, portability, fungibility, all of those different properties. Um, 
all of those are the fundamental way of assessing like, here's what makes Bitcoin good. And when you think about it from that framework, a property of something is something inherent to it. So it's not backed by anything. And this idea that money needs to be backed by something is more of a fiat type of thinking because, you know, gold didn't, wasn't ever backed by anything. Um, it was only once we had paper money in the evolution of paper money, where paper money had all these certain monetary properties. It was very efficient. It was highly, you know, it was highly portable. We had different inventions like the, uh, you know, the telegraph, double entry bookkeeping, the printing press, and then paper money was perfect for moving trade across Europe very efficiently. Problem with paper is that it's not scarce. So we had to back it by something that had a monetary property of scarcity. And that's what gold standards emerged off of. And that's why the concept of money needs to be backed by something emerged. And then, um, and then once politicians really got a hold of this and we turned into a fiat based system, you know, they totally just, uh, you know, retarded the meaning of the word. And now it's backed by the government, which just means violence and control. Um, and, and people don't even know what the word actually means anymore. But I think it's I think it's important to really think about money from the perspective of good money doesn't need to be backed by anything. It has strong inherent properties to it. And now all these questions of like energy. Well, it's enabled. By those things the same way that the bitcoin network is enabled by contracts it's, it's enabled by jurisdictions it's enabled by mining hardware it's metal you know different other commodities are involved too and in, in fact you know energy backs everything so it's not necessarily a distinct way of defining you know some sort of backing for it um, so i think that there's a lot of things that enable bitcoin to exist but if we're trying to think about it from an economic framework then we really need to boil it down to good money isn't backed by anything it has inherent properties and it's enabled by all these other different functions that exist in the world, which pretty much boils down to capital and labor that support its existence in the same way that gold has capital and labor that supports its existence. Um, so getting back to your question, like, you know, what, what's the seventh property? I think that, you know, Bitcoin was an innovation in the truest sense that, um, Bitcoin allowed for us to have all these benefits of, you know, the efficiencies of, you know, portability and divisibility and fungibility that exist within, you know, kind of like the paper system that we had prior. And it enabled us to have all of that, which was formerly a trade off, which is why we had to tie gold and paper together to get the benefits of both. And we actually just collapsed that all into, into one thing. We said, no, like we can actually have the benefits of both here. Um, and that's why it's a very major innovation. So what makes Bitcoin distinct from all other forms of money in history is its immutability. And, uh, and what I boiled it down to is that that immutability is a property. It's enabled by decentralized production, storage, and uh, verification of money. So if we have this monetary network and it's decentralized across those three functions, which are, you know, the three primary ways that financial intermediaries get involved in some sort of, uh, you know, monetary medium, then we have the property of immutability. So now that we've actually created this innovation, um, if we, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's some new innovation that emerges 20 years from now, who knows what's going to happen? We need to be assessing money from the framework of seven properties and defining good money as something that actually has a property of immutability as well. Because we made that innovation, there's no reason in going backwards anymore. Um, and that should be part of like the fundamental framework. I love it. Also, I have to ask, it looks like you are sitting directly in front of a sleeping bag. Uh, so there's my whiteboard behind me, which I always have. And I, and I had a bunch of, um, I had a bunch of stuff on it. And then the other side had a bunch of stuff on it. And it was like, right before the car, I was like, oh crap. So I threw a blanket over it. Love it. I'm not a big fan of putting in the backgrounds. Yeah. Some very, very secretive stuff. Uh, one, one thing I want, I want to unpack this because to be honest i've literally cited your book in so many arguments for now the last like six months roughly and it was the way you broke down the history of banking and more specifically the history of how we have literally done this gone from a gold-backed fiat currency removing the gold backing and then on an average time span of almost 50 years there's a catalyst that causes the central government to essentially come out and say, Hey, the price for this good commodity or whatever is now locked. And then it, it's like clockwork. Then the whole system collapses and then you have to restart it. And we're kind of bearing witness to that. And I'd love it if you could kind of maybe rehash the first iteration of this, uh, 
with the banks in Italy in the Renaissance in the 1300s um, and maybe what you're seeing similar today? Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, I think what's like most relevant to the system we're in today was probably more what happened in the Bank of England with the Goldsmith banking. So, you know, I go into the banks in Italy because those were kind of within the Western world, the, um, you know, the very, the very first example of, you know, the emergence of fractional reserve banking, its failure. And then, um, and then also what made those distinct is that they actually sustained periods without fractional reserve banking for quite some time where they were very successful and they were actually just you know, they're operating as depository institutions where they were simply holding funds, they weren't lending beyond their reserves, and they were charging a fee for doing that service for people. And that was always a very sustainable system. But, you know, our modern system is really more built off of what emerged from England. And in England, you know, there was, um, you know, it was pretty interesting. So if you if you go back to this point in time, when you know, we had we had the Middle Ages and people were emerging out and, the, the you know, the idea of banking was kind of like this emergent phenomenon, you know, people who are accumulating wealth at this stage, they were, um, you know, a lot of it, that's why treasure chests existed, for example, like people would actually hide their money or they would store it on their person or things like that. And then it was only the ultra wealthy that were storing their money. So like, I mean, a, a, an early example of that was, you um, there was the Roman temple of Huno Moneta, and that was where a lot of that. So that's where actually Roman coinage existed. And, and the, the name Moneta, it's a personification of one of their gods. Um, and that's actually because the minting was done in, um, within that temple. Money, monetary, comes from Moneta out of that Roman term. Um, but, you know, that's where a lot of the wealthy back then would store some of their money within that temple. And, um, and that was kind of what a lot of people would depend on. They kind of depended on religious institutions or government institutions for storage. You know, it was like this wealthy service that existed for centuries. Um, and then it was in England where people were storing it in monasteries um, and they were storing it in the, you know, a London vault that uh, was controlled by the government. And there was, you know, at first, so Charles the, uh, Charles the first ended up appropriating a lot of that wealth that existed within um you know the people were storing within those vaults so it caused this, this huge scare within england and people started to you know take their money privately they didn't want to have it in these centralized forms of storage and then we kind of had the emergence of like you know this this initial private banking system and that was the uh the goldsmith bankers so there were these goldsmiths who had vaults that, you know, they would they would be smithing different monetary metals for people. And because they already had the infrastructure built out, it made a lot of sense for people to just start storing their money with them. They had all this excess capacity. They would charge a fee. You store your gold with the goldsmiths. Um, and the system kind of emerged privately in that, you know, the goldsmiths really quickly realized, well, you know, Jim has got a bunch of gold sitting in the vault. He's not moving that anytime soon. It's been sitting here for, you know, a year and a half now. We could probably lend 10% of it out to somebody else and he wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't be the wiser. And we had this system of fractional reserve lending that emerged privately for a while. Um, it gets a lot more confusing to that and I won't totally go into all the details of it, um, but effectively they started creating a lot of different claims upon the same part of gold. You had a claim from the depositor, you had a claim from uh, the person they're lending it to. Um, but what they did was also really interesting is because they were concerned of appropriation of their wealth from the governments, they wanted to utilize the legal system in a way that would protect them in a certain way. And I found um, when I was researching into a lot of this, I found this paper from, um, it was from this uh, professor at a South Korean university. His name um, escapes me right now, but he goes into the legality of what they were really trying to do. And it's similar to like how modern day trust schemes work, where if you, you know, you put your assets into a trust because a trust muddies what, who owns the asset, you know, it's not really owned by you. It's not really owned by the beneficiary of the trust. And you have this trustee who kind of has control over it. So it puts it into like this limbo world where the legal ownership of it is a lot foggier. 
And th it was effectively kind of a similar concept to what they were implementing these, in these Goldsmith bankers. They started issuing depository receipts, and it was very unclear over the ownership of ultimately who owned the gold. And a lot of the depositors got on board with allowing them to do that because it was creating some form of like legal protection, whereby if the government says, we're going to come to a Goldsmith banker, we're going to you know appropriate some of their wealth, um, then we are going to not only have to deal with a major contraction in the economy because the money supply has expanded a lot further based on the amount of gold sitting there. So not only is the risk of economic contraction a lot more, um, but also if this goes through a court system, we don't really know how it's going to pan out. There's a lot more like legal protection from it. Um, and, and the details of which are a lot more complicated, but that's kind of like a high level idea. And, um, uh, so anyways, that system emerged, it expanded very greatly, and then it ultimately ended up having a very major contraction. And that was what was utilized by, um, you know, the, uh, um, the powers that be at that time, the government of England, to ultimately say, like, this isn't a very sustainable, that, you know, the Bank of England needs to have control over this. And the Bank of England ultimately emerged as a way to, um, uh, it, it was, um, when the government was also participating in the system and then the government ended up defaulting on their participation in that system, they created the Bank of England as a way to pay back their debts to the Goldsmith bankers. So the government was the one who ultimately kind of caused this initial issue. And when they created that, um, and the Bank of England emerged. Bank of England also emerged for a variety of reasons. You know, they were at war with France and they needed to finance that too. And that was another major motivation. Um, but it was funny because when the Bank of England emerged, it was ultimately as a justification of to pay off the people that they screwed over in this private banking system, but they inherently blamed how the, um, the private banking system was unsustainable. And ultimately we kind of see this pattern of centralization throughout history that occurred through these banks where they would... Um, the government would cause either an issue in the private markets or they would use an issue in the private markets as justification for them to get more control over the system. And then ultimately they would take a lot of that control themselves and they'd cause the same problem themselves. So when we had the bank of England emerge, well, what happened? It was initially, it was actually pure fiat money and they tried to make that work and they issued it to private markets and it was completely rejected. So they reverted back to a gold standard and, um, and then eventually we saw the Bank of England um, expand and then ultimately default on its position um, in the future. And we see kind of like these these emergences of central banks out of war, out of a need to finance, you know, major debt obligations, them taking on uh, this responsibility from private markets, ultimately causing the exact same issue themselves and then ultimately having some sort of major, you know, uh, economic dislocation and re regime change that occurs at a certain point. You guys still with me? Yeah. No, sorry. I was, I got distracted and I greatly apologize. I was just, yeah, sorry. I was, I was rambling for a bit there. No, no, it's no, no, no. Right. <laughs> there's, there's an interesting thought that I've kind of been stuck on it and maybe it's just because like I'm stuck on it and I refuse to give it up. Um, but the idea of price fixing and how it sort of really is the catalyst for a lot of the collapses here. Um, I'm curious if you think or are paying attention to any commodity in particular that the U S government may or may not try to insert themselves and insert some sort of a price regulation or cap limit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, well, you know, if I, I guess if the question is try, they're, they'll try to do whatever they can. But, um, you know, I think what, what I've, you know, what the U.S. government is always drawn to is basic needs and commodities that are, you know, primarily associated with that. So energy and housing. Um, so and, and we've seen, obviously, we're seeing calls for that. Um, but what's going to happen in the end is <clears throat> in the energy industry is pretty interesting. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert on the energy industry. And, and there's a lot of different ways to speculate on how it'll go. But um, but in the real estate markets as well, I think that we, you know, hopefully we won't if the demand from, you know, some of this quantitative tightening starts to really ease that market. But, you know, I, I, I would look to those as kind of the initial for price controls that are going to be implemented. And I'm, we're certainly going to see them in, in some form one way or another. 
I mean, look, I literally just went and paid five eighty nine for gas at Costco of all places, and and I'm almost willing to accept one of the idiots to come out and say, "Hey, the price of oil cannot go higher than a uh, hundred fifty dollars or two hundred fifty dollars a barrel." Um, I want to I want to play a little thought experiment though, if, if you'll entertain this. Like, what, I love to play. So whoever we want to say, but let's just say the U.S. government has now come out. Oil and gas prices are so crazy that they are saying we will not pay more than two hundred and fifty dollars for an oil of for a barrel of oil. What happens domestically and what happens internationally, in your opinion? Um. Well, okay, that's interesting. Um. So the first thing I'd say is when you fix a price, then you have a supply and demand imbalance. But I don't know enough about like the reserve levels and how that all works within the market. Um, so the first thing is if we do start price fixing that I, I would assume they would initially, you know, default into the option of, you know, increasing the supply of the reserves that we have sitting around. Um, I don't know how long that expands or what the runway is, or if that can ultimately, you know, bring it down to the certain level. Um, but, you know, just assuming that, you know, analysis like ceteris paribus, um, I think that you're, if you have a price fix, then you typically have a supply shortage in some form. Hopefully that can be made up by reserves. And then, um, you know, on the international level, it's not good, right? It's once again, a supply shortage that exists. And, um, and I think the, you know, kind of the interesting piece around this whole discussion is, uh, you know, the sanctions on Russia, we effectively created you know, similar to like the crisis in 08, we created this distinction between commodities and we, we effectively created like a new class of like subprime commodities. All these Russian commodities that have been sanctioned are now kind of like these subprime assets. And, um, but, you know, and, and typically would solve that issue through a bailout of the system. And we have a buyer that steps in. We have a centralized buyer that steps in. So it's very unique to the situation is that, you know, the buyer who steps in is the one that's sanctioning the purchase of it in the first place. So we don't really have a buyer of last resort. And, um, you know, what I think would happen is that the people who are the, the countries that want to opt into support of Russia or don't have the same political ties to the U.S., um, they'll probably start opting in as a buyer of last resort. And, uh, and, and this is happening across, you know, a variety of different things. So energy markets and, um, and energy is the least because of how dependent we are on it. Um, but, you know, all the other commodities that Russia is creating, um, as well as their debt, which we've seen this week, and um, that, you know, they're, they're blocking a lot of the countries, you know, the NATO countries are blocking the ability for Russia to actually pay it. Russia saying like, well, we can't pay it. We're ready to pay it. And they're saying, well, we're not allowing you to pay it. So now there's all these legal scholars hopping in, like, are they in default? And, you know, they're going to have some sort of big debate about that. But what I see is like, you know, kind of, so from the area that I came from, you have like the stressed debt buyers and they're people who just like wait for opportunities like this, where you have to get through a legal system and they specialize in understanding how that works with that. And, um, so I'm guessing on the debt side of things, what we would see is Russia is going to have probably some class of like distressed buyers step in. And it's because this is happening on an international level, you know, that's likely going to be some form of country. It's like if you can buy a bunch of super cheap debt because they're not being allowed to pay it, then you might as well step in and do it. Um, so the question is going to be which countries are we going to see that's going to step in and do that? And, you know, we have China with Argentina and Brazil are talking and in discussions about, you know, supporting one another and all those other different alliances. Um, so I, could, I, I think we'll see people making up for that difference in some sort of form there as well. Uh, but a lot of this stuff gets into geopolitical arguments and, and that's, that's complicated. I'm not an expert on that. Cool. So I'm going to ask you a geopolitical question on that note. Um, Please don't. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Um, it's too late. <laughs> I want to get a sense from you then of like, I have a theory with Putin, which is not that there's no rhyme or reason. It's purely, I, he wants to sow chaos and not even in Ukraine or Russia, but he wants to sow chaos around the world, 
we see a lot of these wheat shortages that are starting to pick up in places like Sri Lanka and a, a few other developing nations are slowly starting to be watched as potential places to just run out of food resources. Um, at what point do we start to look at things like wheat in the same way that we start to look at oil? Oh, interesting. Um, I don't know if I have a very clear answer. Yeah, go ahead. Let me just, uh, in my head, the way I look at it is oil at least is energy to trans uh, for transportation purposes. But wheat and food in general is energy for us living purposes. So that's kind of where my, like, I do think those are weirdly connected, but I don't know, maybe I just smoke too much weed. Yeah, no, I I don't think that's weird at all. I mean, if you yeah, you just have to think about it like um, you know, we have we have raw material inputs that go into labor and that allows us to create all the things that we use. And any sort of raw material input that exists is very valuable. And the question is proportionally what are the most valuable? And energy for a very long time has been that and I think that that's why it's been the topic of the discussion to your point it's like well you know if wheat is also very valuable and we've never really had a major scarcity of that commodity and now 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 we do then will that rise in um, you know it's like geopolitical nature and ultimately we're going to see some sort of prioritization of it in some form um, I think it's definitely possible, but, you know, mind you that like all of these systems that have really created that made the energy, uh, the energy industry, such a geopolitical, you know, centerpiece in the wheel of our global, um, global commodity trade, you know, that took a long time to set up. And there was a lot of agreements that existed for that to occur. Uh, so I think a lot of the changes that we'll see with, you know, all these other different commodities will probably be affecting price a lot more. Um, and if we do want to get something set up, then, you know, taking a step back and we can get a little, little geopolitical here. Um, so with, you know, if we were to start seeing, um, you know, some form of, uh, growth in, uh, military expansion. So that's probably the right way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so if we have, you know, the energy industry has been um, implemented as uh, this commodity that is the petrodollar that's defined in dollars. And that is all predicated upon agreements set up so that we, the U.S. being a military authority in the world, will trade their military authority to all the governments that want to transact and export these energy commodities um, in U.S. dollars. So they say, you do your transactions of this major global commodity that everybody needs in U.S. dollars, and we'll support you with our military in some, some way, shape, or form. Um, so to hit on your question, like, will that trade exist for other commodities? That's kind of what it ultimately would boil down to. And um, I think the problem for the U.S., at least in this position, is that, number one, the U.S. has been kind of contracting their military uh, presence abroad in a lot of different ways. And we've been doing it more in like supplies and resources, but from a more tangible perspective, um, we've been contracting that significantly. And we see what's happening with like Saudi Arabia and how Saudi Arabia has been denominating the trade in the dollar. They're not getting the same military support that they used to from the US. And, um, and now they're saying, okay, well, we might consider a Petro Yuan. And that's, you know, a lot of people are really pushing like that's going to be some highly probable thing or it's a very, um, you know, going to be some sort of major catalyst. I'd push back a little bit on that just because, well, now they have to be trusting if they're going to make that trade with China, then they have to start trusting military support from China. And China has a horrible reputation. So that's a very scary person to get in bed with. And I don't think necessarily think that they would just be, you know, aching to do that. Um, so that's kind of the way that I would think about it for any particular commodity. And, you know, all those systems take a lot of time to set up. Um, but I, I don't know if that kind of answers the question. No, it does. I mean, we're just in this truly bonkers moment. I think in human history, while there have been examples in the past of, I think, global reserve currencies or societies crumbling, we have not, I think, borne witness to a globally connected world where what happens on the other side of the world, we could very well see because someone has an iPhone in their pocket and is recording it. And I think that to me makes events that are happening in maybe 
places that I've never even explored, like Sri Lanka, perfect example. Like I've never set foot in that country. And yet I now know on a different, in a different way, what's going on versus 50, hundred years ago. Like you would have never even given thought to the fact that something is going on in Eastern Asia. Like we just wouldn't be thinking about those things. Um, I wonder how much, and I don't hold it against you because quite frankly, most, I'm going to just say it like this. Most of you white people don't really know what goes on with my homeland of Iran, <laughs> but like on the point of bringing up like Saudi Arabia and China starting to align, I thought something very interesting uh, has been going on. That I've been pounding this drum since before Putin even went into Ukraine but that Iran, China, and Russia had been sitting down and having regular meetings. And to me, it was a sign that, hey, these two countries that maybe aren't necessarily under sanctions are sitting down and meeting with the leader of a country that has been under sanctions for just about 50 years, like 40 plus years, asking how have you operated? Like, you haven't died off. Your country is still there. You may not be flourishing, but you've survived through a whole generational cycle, so how? And then lo and behold, here we are, and you have Russia under sanctions, and I still believe China will eventually try to take Taiwan, but secretly during all of this stuff, Iran, Russia, and China have now made a new agreement, and Iran is sending oil to these two countries. And it's the reason why I was kind of bringing up the locking the oil prices, and what's happening with oil and wheat, and now me bringing all of this up is to say, how much longer is the petrodollar going to be the global standard, in your opinion, um, versus a new globally accepted system? I genuinely believe what could very well happen is in the same way in America, like we still measure in inches and feet and pounds and nowhere else in the world does, we could accidentally fall into a system where we're the only ones in the world using the dollar because we still think it's great and nobody else gives a rat's ass. But again, this is just conspiracy theory Q with a couple of tinfoil hats and a few joints. Yeah, man, let's, uh, let's get weird right now. Um, so I think that the, uh, and no, I don't, I wouldn't call it a conspiracy theory either. Um, I think that just, I, I think the right way of kind of framing that question rather than like, when does a petrodollar fall is, um, you know, what, what trends are we seeing in terms of global monetary adoption of which currencies, as well as their assets as well, because they're all kind of interconnected in this fiat system. Um, so I, I, you know, actually, I, I did a write up on this back in uh, April for Bitcoin magazine. And um, I walked through, you know, what we're seeing in terms of adoption of the dollar at a global level as well as the other major developed economies that are considered you know reserve currencies and then what's happening with a lot of the other small countries and uh, you know really the thesis that i ultimately boiled it all down to is what we're witnessing this year um, in particular this year and the sanctions on russia were a major major catalyst to this and this is probably going to be viewed as the beginning of the structural change in the Bretton woods system that emerged out of 1971 um, is a shift in trust at a global level. So in a way to think about that is that, you know, if you think about like a fiat economy um, and why people want to be using dollars, well, there, there's, let's think about this from the perspective of the functions of money. So you have money as a store of value, as a medium of exchange and as a unit of account. The, uh, the medium of exchange unit of account piece is kind of tied together, but we'll start with like store of value. So as a store of value, you want an asset that is stable and very liquid. So if we're looking at this from a fundamentals perspective, you know, put the geopolitics in your head aside. Um, so if you want something that's very stable and liquid, then the U.S. dollar is the best for that purpose at an international level. Um, and the, there's kind of like three ways that you can kind of boil down a lot of these questions. So I, I think the best way to look at trust is through the lens of, um, if you think about the functions of money and what makes something good and fulfill these functions, then you have to see what's kind of ultimately backing the fiat that really makes it good at those functions of money, right? Like what are the properties of fiat money? Um, and when I think about that, it's really a country's reputation. Um, it's, it's security that it provides to the world. 
And, and it's ultimately boils down to, you know, it, the, the remaining properties of the money. So like the two things to consider really are like reputation and security. And um, the U S has a very good reputation. It has a very politically stable environment. People trust its property rights. I mean, what allowed it to become the largest economy in the world in the shortest amount of time in history was the protection of property rights. And, um, and I think that that's, what's incredibly valuable. Um, and that's what makes the dollar something that people will cling to just at a fundamental level, regardless of the petrodollar and all the geopolitical considerations. So a, a, as a store of value, the dollar is very attractive in that respect. Um, and we're starting to see a shift in a lot of those things that are ultimately back in the dollar. So from the reputation perspective, we're getting a lot more political instability than we've had in a very long time. And an international level, we're also starting to you know, change a lot of our international relationships as well. Um, we're sanctioning other countries, that means the dollar is becoming less liquid. Um, and we're seeing a lot more volatility. So these things are all kind of starting to shift in a more drastic way than they have before, all around like kind of that reputation piece. And then if we go into like the security side of things, well, what really made the dollar a functioning medium of exchange for so long, and it's really because we entrenched it at an international level within this system, uh, by trading military security for its adoption. So having that security, having that military security is how we entrench it. We got a big ass military. We said, we're going to protect you guys. We're going to create stability. We're going to be the global police and you use our money. And we could constantly run a deficit and trade for that. Um, so when we entrenched it kind of as a, like a medium of exchange, that's that security piece. Now, what have we seen in recent years? Well, we're kind of, we're retracting that security piece a bit. So what does that mean? I mean, it means that it's less attractive to use the dollar as a medium of exchange. So if we, you know, if we look at the data and we say dollar denominated assets that have existed, um, uh, foreign exchange reserves, if you look at all the foreign exchange reserves of different countries, um, the dollar in 2000 or the US in 2000 was 72% um, of total international reserves. And that's declined all the way to 59% as of uh, 2021. So that's an 11% change and it's very consistent over two decades. So that means we are starting to see a structural decrease in dollar adoption. But, but what's most interesting about that is that where, well, where's that going? Is it all going to the Euro? Um, is it going to the pound? Is it going to, you know, any of the other major international currencies that we use? And what we, what you notice is that, um, it's mostly going to a lot of the smaller emerging uh, economy currencies that are being used or not necessarily emerging, but, you know, smaller non-developed or, uh, you know, some of the non-rich countries as well. And so we're, what we're seeing is that the dollar is losing dominance and we're seeing more dispersion and fragmentation of what people are actually using. And a lot of this kind of goes back to this thesis of like multipolarity that's starting to exist within the world when they, you know, U.S. was like the global hegemon and we had control or, and our military was policing the world and we maintained control, you know, back in like the 70s and 80s, we're at the peak of that. Um, now we're starting to see that decrease pretty significantly and we're moving to this world where it's not unipolar, it's multipolar. We're seeing other powers emerge and they are starting to, you know, organize amongst themselves. And, you know, personally, I think that that's kind of a good thing. Um, maybe not in the short term, but in the long term. But um, so when I think about some of these shifts that we're seeing, that's that's kind of the primary thing is that the, the dollar is losing dominance. But another frame to think about this in is that not only is the U.S. losing dominance, but credit money as a whole is also starting to lose dominance. So we have like two primary types of money. We have commodity based money. And we have credit money. Fiat's all credit. And um We've also started to see a major shift in reserves going back towards commodities, particularly gold. And, um, and that's particularly occurring within a lot more of these emerging economies that are more removed from our global political system because they have the least amount of cost and able to, in order to adopt them, um, as well as some of these more, uh, the major economies that we're at odds with, with the US. And um, so I think that that growth that we're seeing in commodity money where people are losing trust and reputation and security of governments that's decreasing trust and credit money and in particular in the us as an international hegemon and we're starting to see more dispersion in international reserve assets and we're starting to see more adoption of commodity based monies so like if you look at the total amount of global reserves it's around 16 trillion and if you look at the amount that's controlled by the smaller non-developed economies um 
it's about 12 and a half trillion of that amount. It's a very significant proportion and it's growing a lot more towards commodity money. So what's the argument? Well, you know, the, the argument's more that that's going to benefit gold um, and it will benefit gold in a very significant way. Um, but there is, I think for Bitcoin, Bitcoin is going to get a slice of that pie. And the question is, what slice of that pie is it going to get? Now for us, and we understand Bitcoin, we say, why doesn't he get the whole fucking pie? And it's because there is a lot of other considerations around gold that make it something because it's more entrenched. Like when I go back to what makes something a good store of value, it's stable and it's liquid. Gold is much more stable and liquid than Bitcoin is right now. So it's going to be superior. If you're a central bank and you say, okay, I, I, I legitimately want to put 50% of my reserves into a commodity-based money, you can't just make the bet on Bitcoin out the gate, particularly if you're a larger economy. So you're going to put a lot of that in gold, but Bitcoin's going to get a piece because Bitcoin's benefits are that you know it's um, it has a much higher capital appreciation or ex expected capital appreciation than gold would. Um, it is operating on a disintermediated payment network and the trustless storage of it is also a lot higher. So those three benefits are appealing to banks as well, or uh, central banks and global governments as well. So if you look at those three benefits and you'd say, okay, Bitcoin's definitely gonna get a slice of this pie, and, you know, how big is that gonna be? And that's, that's the major speculation, but that's the primary shift that I think we're seeing. So we're, it, the dollar is not going away anytime soon. Um, it's going to exist for quite some time, but we are witnessing a gradual decrease. We are starting to see a lot more fragmentation. A lot of that's going into commodity money and Bitcoin, I think is going to get a pretty big chunk of that. And I think we're going to actually see a lot more gradual adoption over time, which I think is so important. I think if we do have some sort of major catalyst that spawns chaos in the world and Bitcoin's a part of that, that's probably what we don't want. What we want is gradual adoption with countries where people don't really give a shit. And eventually it'll get to a point where when that catalyst does hit, it's just going to be too far to turn back. I think there was, there's a lot to unpack there. And I want to start I think, <laughs> first with the idea of protection. Um, you know, I think the, the best example in recent memory is the way the U.S. handled Afghanistan and in particular at the exit and how quickly all of the military supplies that were provided and the training and the money that was given to this country was very quickly essentially like went into the hands of the side we were fighting against and not, not necessarily saying like it was just handed to them, but more through the lens of they got their hands on it because we didn't do a good enough job nor have we really done a good job if you continue to look back and back as each decade of which war we fought and what region you can go as far back arguably to korea to where we haven't really i think fulfilled the promise of u.s security safety and supremacy and i'm i'm wondering if something like Oh my God, China stepped in during the Russia-Ukraine war and they saved Ukraine. Is China the new global like power validating their deal with Saudi Arabia and then other countries start to go to them and exit? Like what, what in your mind is the type of event that would take the U.S. out of that stature that it strangely still holds today despite its track record, in my opinion, signaling it should no longer? Um. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think you're spot on with the idea that, uh, you know, we're going to see China kind of emerge as a competing power. And, and, you know, kind of to my prior point, I'm not expecting that we're going to see another, you know, dominant power globally emerge, but we're going to see division and more competing powers in the U.S. will probably start backing off a bit. So, you know, on that point, China, so China has, um, and in you know, this is a lot of my geopolitical knowledge is referenced from Marco Papich, who wrote the book Geopolitical Alpha. Um, for people with like that are on the financial side of things that want to get a crash course in geopolitics, I, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I, I got to know one of his um, uh, ex colleagues, Jacob Shapiro, as well, who's a really bright guy on the geopolitical spectrum. And um, he works at the strategic funds. And I, I think you should look up what he's writing as well. Um, but, you know, the, you know, from what I've read from these guys, like the major issue with China, um, 
China has this big, with their growth into like the developed economy world, one of the big issues you have when you have start to get this rapidly expanding middle class is the middle income trap. So that's like GDP per capita that ranges between about a thousand to 12,000. Mm -hmm. And if you can't break out of that middle income trap, then you typically start to see, and China's you know, acutely aware of this, that that is typically the end of communist regimes and they have to get the wealth of their middle class above that amount. So I think the key issue when you know, people are asking, you know, will China invade Taiwan? And I think another thing to look out for too is when like these geopolitical topics come up and that guy Marco Papich references this, you know, it's kind of like the primary thesis of his book is that people like to talk about geopolitics from the perspective of preferences. Um, and they'll say like, well, China wants to dominate the world. Um, China wants this or Russia wants this. They're going to do this because they want it. And it's not just about what they want. It's about what they're constrained by. So the question is just to say, okay, well, what do they want? But what are they constrained by? And they're ultimately going to go for whatever they can that, you know, considering what they're constrained by. And China's constrained kind of by this middle income trap. And they're reaching the peak of their debt cycle right now. So the economy is not necessarily in a position to where wealth is going to be getting accrued much more rapidly. And, and they're a bit weaker. And the question is, um, will China invade Taiwan? And they're in, you know, I was, um, uh, uh, his name is escaping me right now. Uh, Kyle Bass. Uh, Kyle Bass responded to one of my things on Twitter when I was kind of like bringing up this point, and this was kind of my response to it. Uh, but he had this thread about Chinese aggression and what he thinks they're planning on doing. My response is that, you know, um, I think that this will probably be, if we have to go into some sort of aggressive situation with China, that'll probably be the next major catalyst for when, you know, the Federal Reserve's like, we need to start printing money a lot more again. It's going to be if we like go to war with China in some sort of form. Um, and then Kyle was just like, not necessarily, you know, economic sanctions are probably our best route. And we have quite a bit of influence over that with economic sanctions. And, you know, that's ab absolutely true. But I, I think that the issue is that, um, if we do economically sanction China in ways that are going to go after their middle class, and that's that's our pain point, that's how we hit them hard, then they're going to be really forced. They're going to be between a hard place and a rock, and they may become aggressors over that. Um, and it may not even be they're going after Taiwan, but they, they're they going to be probably become aggressive because they're going to start running out of options. Um, and I think that will be one of the, the major issues that really brings China out. And then the question becomes, OK, so if we do get into that, you know, that's when I think real war might start. Um, and it'll probably be over Taiwan. And I'm kind of I'm betting a bit more that they do go into Taiwan for those reasons. Um but I, I, I think it's going to start with, you know, very heavy economic sanctions. And um, once we get to that point, I think the question of, you know, how, how that all ultimately pans out is, you know, um, I think the U.S. is perhaps particularly if we have these alternative commodities and emerging markets that are gaining strength and value, it's going to be so much more costly for the U.S. to go to war, to go to war. Um, if you consider, you know, our economic position going into World War II and World War I, um, we were much more stronger and we had a lot more leverage back then. Now we are entrenched as a global monetary reserve, so we can do that. But I mean, that's effectively what happened to England after World War I, and they ultimately lost their monetary authority over all the burden that they had to bear from printing all the money they did to finance that war to the US. So, I mean, it creates a situation that's ripe for the, if we go into like some sort of major global war, and we're in this weak economic position that we're in, we could become what England was in World War One again. Um, and so that ultimately might mean that they might back off at a certain point. And we might start to see that multipolarity exist and China start to emerge more heavily and capture Taiwan. And, you know, domestic industries in the West might have to emerge that are, um, you know, that are a lot more labor intensive that we've typically outsourced to Eastern economies, which, you know, will have its benefits and its costs. I think that's, that's inflationary. Um, but it also means the working class might benefit domestically as well. Um, but there's a million things you could talk about around all that. I mean, I'm down to go down that rabbit hole. I am realizing we only have like maybe 30 minutes left, but I, I will let you pick. We can either keep going down this. Or Shift it. Let's talk about something else. All right. Uh, I want to talk now about just, you know, the goings on in the U.S. government and the idiots in power. 
we've seen Janet Yellen try to walk back what she said about inflation as though nobody in the Bitcoin universe was saying, hey, maybe printing trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars will have a negative effect on, you know, just the money supply. But no one wanted to listen to us. They wanted to listen to themselves. And here we are. We're also seeing our latest White House press secretary try to give us, honestly, I applaud the effort to try and spin the garbage that we have and argue and say the economy is better than ever. Like you must not live in this country. You must have never left your home in the last, I don't know, two years, but newsflash shit is bad. Um, we have inflation numbers coming out tomorrow. We have a new FOMC meeting next week. We have Joe Biden hanging out with Jimmy Fallon. I think it was or whatever late night show he goes on now. First, I want to ask who, who do you hold most responsible for the current climate of the American economy? Whoa. Um, who I'm thinking about how to break that down. Um, it's, I, I think it's hard to answer that in such a pointed way. Um, no, 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 no. We don't need to be thoughtful right now. You can, you can literally just be like, it's Nancy's fault. My, my personal favorite is Lindsey Graham. I fucking hate that man. <laughs> um, I mean, look, you gotta, you gotta hold Jerome over the fire. Um, I, I think that uh, it's. It, it, it was it was very obvious that they were overshooting their stimulus. Um, and I think it's and you know, to your point, we weren't saying that, you know, that that, that that was said in hindsight or as well as it was said, you know, before the fact um, from, you know, assuming that their goals are reasonable goals, their goals of, you know, price stability and economic stability. Um, I think that there the you know the feds lost just like a ton of credibility and um and people are starting to understand the narrative that you can't just print money um endlessly and and like you know much more broader sense and it's becoming a you know political topic which i think is so important just because it hasn't been for so long and um you know to, to people in our world it, it is but when you go talk to like you know your average joe who's watching fox or cnn and every night like it wasn't popping up as much for them um so, you know, I think, um, what, you know, I think what's important kind of around some of these discussions and like, you know, like the Bitcoin community is you don't want to be right about things for the wrong reasons. And um, you want to make sure that you think about it in the right way. And, you know, there are a lot of these things are tied together. But I think, you know, the whole like transitory inflation argument and then the people who are like on the other side and they were the deflationists. I, I think that the deflationists had, you know, they have a, had a strong argument. They still do have a strong argument. I think eventually it's going to be borne out in some form in a short term way. I don't think it's going to be a persistent form of deflation, at least not within the next 20 years. Um, but I think it'll be a short term form of deflation. And, you know, I think that a lot of the inflationists were kind of right about this because, um, you know, the, the way that you can think about you know, I like to think about inflation. It's kind of like you're, you're skipping a rock across the economy. We have some sort of change and then we have the first hit and it bounces and there's a bunch of ripple effects that come from that. And then we have the second hit and those ripple effects come and, and then the ripple effects start to run into each other. And it's, it's a really complicated thing to make arguments for. And I think a lot of people will make these arguments based on one understanding of the problem. Um, but I think there's like, there's like three primary buckets that you can think about inflation from first thing, supply and demand. And, the supply and demand of any price of any good around the world at any given point in time, there's some sort of theoretical average of what that price level is. Um, CPI is an attempt to measure that. But we have the supply and demand piece that exists and then structural changes within the global economy. And those typically occur for ge geopolitical reasons and you know things like lockdowns and trade wars and all of that, um, or major cycles that we go through with business and economic cycles. Those will impact that. And there's a lot of arguments to be made for what can happen at that level, and how that'll ultimately impact the overall level of prices. That gets really complicated. And, and you know, so I think the deflationists were making their arguments not 
really considering that that what they did consider is that you know this particular trade issue that we were starting to see with supply shortages was going to resolve itself quickly and they ended up being wrong about that for a variety of different reasons um but what they were primarily focusing a lot of their arguments around was that um when we you know quote unquote print money is that something that expands money supply and and what a lot of people don't understand is that you know it's not necessarily you know when the fed is buying an asset it doesn't necessarily put money into the economy and there's there's you know what happened during the pandemic was highly inflationary and this is where i kind of you know lost um you know i lost sight of some of the arguments that the deflationists were making because with the amount of fiscal deficit spending that we had where we had very direct helicopter money going into the economy then that's money into circulation i mean you can make it it's not qe it's something very different and and that's highly inflationary and we're seeing inflation from that um now if we look at it from monetary policy from the perspective of quantitative ease, easing, the question becomes like, okay, we buy assets directly from banks within the economy. And what we do is banks kind of have two things. They can either have something as a reserve or um, something that's sitting on their balance sheet is like, you know, a, uh, is a deposit or a loan. Um, so like there are, uh, or sorry, is a, is a loan, not deposit. And, um, so when we do QE, we go to the banks and we say, okay, I'm the Fed. I'm going to create money on my computer and I'm going to buy some of those assets that are things that aren't considered reserves. And we're going to convert them. When we buy them from you, we're effectively converting them into reserves. So like the deflationists will argue like, you know, quantitative easing is just a bank recapitalization. We're changing the capital of the balance sheet of the banks. And when they recapitalize it as something with a reserve, they now increase the amount of firepower that that bank has with their ability to lend more. Um, but the problem is, is we kind of stressed that. So because we've lent so much within the system, because interest rates have been so low for so long, and we've had all this monetary stimulus, there comes a point where it doesn't really matter if you give them more firepower, they don't have a target to shoot at. So they're just like, look, we, you know, we could loan, look at all the absurd companies that are getting money right now, or, um, you know, all these absurd mortgages that are getting issued when stimulus, you know, comes the way that it does. And eventually banks kind of hit a stopping point. They're just like, okay, um, there's not much more else we can do here. And then the money doesn't get circulated into the economy. And like their, their argument is kind of based around that. So, you know, when the Fed starts to shift their policy and we start to increase interest rates and we start to make it uh, debt less, uh, we start to decrease the supply of debt. Well, first and foremost, before we really start to see a contraction in like credit, we're going to have to wait for. Um, so this gets in kind of like to the repo facility and a good way of thinking about this is um the repo, when people look at like that reverse repo chart, where like it just like spikes all of a sudden in 2021, and now it's at like $2 trillion balance and everybody's like, this is bad, you know, where did this come from? Really all it means is that banks don't have anywhere to loan. So they start to just give the money back to the Fed and the Fed pays them a very small, small interest rate on it. Um, so that balance of 2 trillion that's sitting in the repo facility, you can think about that as like, here's the amount of, you know, over QE that the Fed pushed in the economy, where banks just got all this money, like, what the hell do we do with this? We can't lend it to anybody. We're just going to give it back to you guys. So with all this quantitative tightening that we're going to start doing, um, and with the rising interest rates, we have like $2 trillion of repo facility that these banks are going to have to loan out, and they're going to have to decrease that account before we really start to see any significant change from it. So my point being, in, in like summary, is that the Fed has got a lot of leeway here because they push so much stimulus with how much they can actually contract. And like, people are like, Oh, well, equity markets are declining and things like that. But if you look at credit markets, like they they actually got a lot of leeway. Uh, there's also an interest rate argument for it too, but I've been, I've been rambling again. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tune it down here, but you know, um, but yeah, that's when, when you think about this, uh, I'll, I'll bring it back to the inflation piece that we were talking about. So, those are how the expansion and contraction of the money supply exists. And, um, and if we do see expansion uh, in the money supply and drastic increases, then that is also inflationary. And right now, we're just not in an environment that's very fertile for it because credit's already just been expanded so much and our money is credit. So if you can't expand credit that much, then you can't expand money that much. Um, and then the last kind of bucket that I was talking about, I said supply and demand. And then I said um, the, uh, you know, how we are our measuring stick, which is the money supply and that changes in that. 
and then we also have changes in the way that we like measure all that. That's like your CPI. You know, I, that, that's a scam. The, but in, in, in argument in favor of the CPI is that uh, it's kind of a, it's a task that I don't think anybody can really effectively do. It's a theoretical concept that they're trying to measure. Um, but that being said, every sort of change that they make to it is always biased in favor of, um, you know, the government. So that tells you that they're not really acting in an intellectually honest way with how they're trying to attempt that measurement. Um, but, you know, the CPI is definitely a scam. Well, I think you've already answered the question that I was going to ask, but of, all of the things that are going on right now that the government talks to us about, what's the thing that pisses you off the most? So I guess I'll just ask, CPI number comes out tomorrow. What is your expectation and do you think they will give another adjustment on the calculation to make it fit what they want? Um, the, the, most of the adjustments occurred back in uh, the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s. Um, but, you know, I think that they will, uh, the key thing I want to read into before tomorrow is what's going on with inventories, um, because I was hearing conflicting things. This morning I was reading something that, uh, what's her face, uh, Kathy Wood was saying like inventories at companies are actually very, they're starting to accumulate significantly right now. And I was reading a bunch of stuff contrary to that. So I want to get to the bottom of that. I don't know if that'll, that's probably not going to impact this current CPI number, but it might in the next few months. Um, I'm expecting it to stay kind of in a similar range to where it's at right now. I mean, a lot of the changes probably won't be, it's, it's a delayed indicator, um, which most central banking policy is all kind of based on information from three or four months ago. And then it doesn't appear in the CPI for another three more months after that, or depending, I mean, on the real estate piece, even a lot longer because it's a smooth average. Um, so I kind of want to look into the inventory piece. I think that that's probably something really important for people to look into. Um, but so I guess until I look into that, I don't really know, but I'm expecting it to be kind of flat in these numbers. Uh, why or what's leading you to believe that these numbers are going to come flat? Like, what are you seeing out in the world that's like, oh, that that should lead to this? Or is this just... I mean, your gut is probably a lot stronger than my gut at judging these type of things. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just more like when you get into the details of how it's calculated, it's like, okay, we've, we, we've seen these rising prices. We finally had it flatten out um, over the last reading. So, or the April reading. So when we looked at March 8.3, we look at April 8.1, when we're now going to be getting May on Friday, um, the question is, is, okay, well, what significant changes have occurred that are going to make prices come down in this next reading? And I can't think of anything that was recent enough to impact this next reading. Now, we've had changes that have occurred and impacted asset values pretty significantly, um, and prices continue to rise from like an energy level. But I think that, you know, none of that's probably going to be hitting this current reading, I'd expect it to be pretty, I'd expect 8.1 to 8.3 range, maybe 7.9 ish, somewhere in there. Um, but you know, I'm not an expert on these things. I've done a little bit of work into reading into some of it and I have a little bit of an idea, but, um, but yeah, that's probably what I'd say when you think about the CPI, it's, just, it's based on delayed information. Um, and it's also calculating it in a delayed way as well. So it's, it, it kind of lags a lot of things. I don't give a shit what they say. Gas is still more expensive than it was yesterday. That's that's my barometer for inflation right now. Is <laughs> the second gas at Costco is more than six dollars a gallon? Like shit's gonna get weird here in LA. Like there are places in in Los Angeles that it's it's pr pressing almost ten dollars to a point where like we're having conversations in my household at least of like, do you need to drive there? Do you need to drive there? Wait, that is so, fucking crazy. I just want to be clear. There are places where you go to buy gas where it's over $10 or it's about $10 a gallon. There is nowhere that I have stepped foot okay. in. However, there are places that have above $9 a gallon gas in Los Angeles, specifically in downtown Los Angeles. So not the most ideal place. But it doesn't I matter. Like, you should be able to get gas for cheaper than that. Well, so 
it's rather it should never be that expensive in my mind i i got into this conversation with like my girlfriend and a few friends because she works in downtown and a few other of our friends work in downtown and it's like that picture went viral of oh this gas station has more than nine dollars to count oh it's now it's over 950 like it's creeping up there and very fast and if you actually look at a map it's like in this part of downtown there is only two other gas stations and downtown los angeles is not a place anyone even people who live in los angeles like we don't go to downtown unless you work there or like you're going to a lakers game no one goes to clippers games <laughs> like maybe a couple of people go to lafc games but like no like that's it it's all you're doing as far as like going to down maybe a music show here or there but like downtown is the worst designed part of los angeles with like these random one-way streets that like one goes this direction and then you think the next block goes the opposite direction it's like actually no the next block then is like a two-way and then the block after that doesn't you're saying they're designed sense. specifically to force you to waste gas this is all part of the nefarious plan it, no, 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 no. it's Careful not about, about well i'll put my tinfoil hat on after i finish this but like this gas station is like so inconveniently located in comparison to the other ones that like if this is the only gas station you see in downtown you have to go to that gas station like if you are out of gas right. and it's part of downtown you're fucked you're not gonna make it to the <laughs> other gas station so you get royally screwed in that regard this was explained to me when i was in high school i have since found the documents you could look this up online but i believe it was in the 70s or 80s essentially the car lobbyists lobbied the state of california and convinced specifically the city of los angeles instead of ramping up development of public transportation specifically like a railway system to actually stop building that and to focus more on building out a what they pitched as the world's super highway and it was supposed to create this system that had like six different freeways going to downtown and and five different freeways going to santa monica and 20 different freeways to get you to all the different parts of the valley and whatnot and the car lobbyists put money towards this they put less than 10 percent towards this part of the law that got passed was it put a moratorium and they stopped outright development of public transportation rails in the city of los angeles for over 30 years and so the car companies hamstrung us left us with the bill the project is incomplete like right now there are three freeways that get you to downtown that's it 110 the 10 and um the five the other i guess you could argue the 101 kind of cuts through and that that's it there were supposed to be three more fucking freeways so I'm at this point just like rambling about how terrible Los Angeles is because I want to leave. Yeah, dude, it sounds like LA kind of sucks. So yeah, anyone want to move here? <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was out there not too long. Well, I went out there for uh, McCormack's podcast back in February, um, and then I came back out because I went to Coachella in April. Um, How's Coachella? Yeah, man, the traffic. Oh, it was a blast, man. It was it was groovy. I nearly cried during Billie Eilish. Love that for you. I love that journey. Yeah. Yeah, was that your first Coachella? Time. It was, yeah. I've never like I went to a few festivals in high school, but I was never a huge festival guy. One, one of my good buddies, he's starting this um this startup, Fanable.com, and it's effectively like competing with Ticketmaster and StubHub. They got financing from uh, Pear, which is like the same VC that did DoorDash. Um, mm -hmm. they they were their initial lead, and um, but so he's a big big tickets guy, and he's like, dude, you got to come out to Coachella. I was like, all right, man. Let's uh, let's send it. I'm trying to convince him to make his startup the first ticketing platform to adopt Bitcoin. Bitcoin NFTs on that platform would go work very well. Just my two cents. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. I do think there's a yeah. Once he's ready comments. for it, I, I I want to talk to somebody because I, I I don't have enough of a knowledge around some of the stuff, but the uh, the accounting side of things for like small businesses and what would be the best platform to uh, for him to adopt if he's going to start doing that because that's his big hang up is the accounting piece of all of it and whether or not it you know jives with their current system. We'll we'll talk offline about this, but there's definitely a lot yeah, of resources yeah. and people we can link you guys up with to make that a reality. Um, Eric, it like makes me sad that our time is is slowly coming to an end. 
Um, <laughs> you, you you don't want to hear me ramble any longer? <laughs> no, I do. I do. I genuinely would. Honestly, one of these days we're just going to be like both Pete or all three of us, Pete, Chris, and I are just going to be sick. And I'm just going to call you and be like, yo, I need you to just go two hours straight. Just two hours straight. <laughs> just a monologue. Go nuts. Um, where can, well, actually before that, um, I want to give you the opportunity to pretend that you are either president of the United States or the head of the Federal Reserve. You could you could take your pick. And what is the first thing you do in that new position? Oh, dude, head of Federal Reserve. Um, I throw a massive party and burn it down. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'd better be invited <laughs> to that party. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a rager. Like it's funny because so I used to go to school in DC and like we used to walk by the like sixteen hundred pen was like not too far. For those who don't know, sixteen hundred pen is the dress for the White House, but like right next to it you also have like the vice president's building. This building is fucking massive. And my fraternity brothers and I, we used to literally like walk by sometimes like while we were smoking a joint or just like whatever look at it and be like yo how sick would it be if like our fraternity like had that house yeah. like, dude, that would be the win for the seniors and the pledges would be there we just fucking rage but that, that's to say like i've already thought this out so keep me in the loop of when you become the head of the federal reserve and want to do this party i, I have some great buildings for us to tear down in that city oh yeah uh, man. Eric, yeah eric for our audience who was not before, how can they stay up to date with what you're doing and what you're writing and who you're trolling? Yeah, just find me on Twitter. Um, I try to not be as much of a troll. I try to I try to crack some jokes every now and then though. Um, follow me at E R I C Y A K E S. My book you can get it on Amazon. It's called The Seventh Property. Um, and I got a website. I do a newsletter thing, but I don't like, I, you know, it's just like I, I, I write stuff every few months or so and I'll kind of like ship it out to people and just say, you know, whatever is on my mind, but it's kind of an infrequent thing, but that's about all I got to shill. Love it. If you guys aren't already. Ooh, I'll show call. this too. Um, if you guys follow Bitmegs on Twitter, see this lightning network t-shirt I got. I love this thing. I got it at the last Bitcoin day conference made by Bitmegs. Um, I think it's Bitmegs on Twitter, but maybe you guys can put it in the link and I'll send it to you. But she's kind of the queen of Bitcoin merch. Oh shit, Raymond Chen, you heard that? She's coming for your job. Uh, that's a great segue, Chris. If you want to plug uh, Bitcoin Day Charlotte this weekend. Yeah, no, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk at Bitcoin Day Charlotte. It's this Saturday in Charlotte, North Carolina. I believe there's still tickets left. Uh, you can go to BitcoinDay.io. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to it. Eric, what was your experience like at Bitcoin day real quick? Which one were you at? Oh, I've been to, I, so I kind of like got started with those guys and the, the first one was back in Omaha in the fall of last year. Um, so I did that one. I did uh, KC, I did Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Oklahoma city, and then they're doing Denver in July. So that'll, that'll be big for me. Cause that's where I'm out of. Bummer, we couldn't meet up in uh, Charlotte, but maybe next time. I know, man. Tell Ed, be like, why didn't you invite Eric to Charlotte? He doesn't like to bring me to the East Coast. Kind of pisses me off, man. You're too close to DC at that point. Yeah. That's really all it is. Good to know that you're in Denver, because next time I'm there, I'm going to hit you up. <laughs> 